Hi everyone. I was so pleased and happy when Michael and David asked me to make up this three size cloth doll from their reprinted from their archives and we're calling her Clara and she is the Christmas doll. As I said, she comes in three sizes. She comes in this size, which is the 16 inch size and you can see her here. And she comes in this cute little 10 inch size. You can see her there. And then she comes in a very tiny little size, about six and a half inches. And you can see her here. So there they are flat and here they are made up. I think um, one of the things that was really fun about this is I got to do a little bit of research on a time period I'm not really that familiar with, which is the 1890s. And I found some German pattern references and made up this little party dress um, out of some um, fabric that the, the Carmel uh, doll shop will have in their boutique. Um, it's a little yoke frilled dress, which is very typical of that time period. Sort of the, the, um, the fabric is kind of reminiscent of, I guess, a jumeau chemisette. Um, or chemise rather. Um, and then I also use this cotton fabric from the Carmel doll shop to make a cape and a tam in two sizes for um, the largest doll, the 16 inch, and for the 10 inch. And I think that they're very, very cute little dolls to play with. I think they're a little bit bigger um, than Mary Marie, maybe, I think. Um, maybe by uh, two inches or so. But, you know, they're just very cute in these sort of matching little costumes and in their little matching outerwear. Uh, the smallest doll I made so she would just have a nightgown because she's so tiny. And um, actually, she might be Mary Marie's size. So maybe she could actually wear some of Mary Marie's clothes, too. But I think that they're a lot of fun. I hope that you have fun with them. Um, I kept sort of imagining um, a mama in the 1890s making these three for her daughter and um, how fun that might be uh, for the little girl to receive on Christmas morning. Um, and you know, most of these dolls were made at home um, by, by family members or, you know, they weren't so much like they were commercially made because they were sold as flat goods, but um, I just think that they're really charming and whimsical, and I think they're perfect for the holidays to get you in the holiday mood. So I hope you have fun with this project. Again, Clara the Christmas doll in her three sizes. Uh, have fun. So here's our doll, flat, uncut. And what I'm going to tell you applies to all three sizes. There are going to be some little adjustments you're going to have to make in terms of the, the, um, the openings on the head, but really the... Very, very simple um, doll, as these sort of mommy-made dolls were, uh, flat cloth dolls. We've got a back, we've got a front, and we've got two um, soles, boot soles. So what we're going to do before we actually cut anything out, within the seam allowance at the top, and I would say probably about a two inch opening on this size doll, we're gonna run a machine stay stitch both on the front and the back. The reason why we're doing that is that this is the area that's gonna be left open for stuffing, and it's gonna have a lot of um, pull as you're stuffing it, you know, some stress, and we don't wanna stretch her out, her top of her head out too much. We wanna keep it nice and, and tight. And this is a great fabric, by the way. I mean, this is a very like firm um, uh, cotton, you know, tightly woven cotton, or maybe it's even a poplin. I'm not quite sure what the weave is, but. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a rough cut around the doll. You know, this is a very narrow little <laughs> um, seam allowance here. Uh, I think that just for ease of handling, when you cut this, you're going to want to make it a little bit larger. And I'm saying probably like a half an inch. And the reason why we're doing that is that you're gonna be handling it a lot. And this fabric can fray, even though it's a very tight weave, it can fray. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be, you know, and you can use a friction for this if you want to be really exact, but you can just eyeball it because once you've sewn it together, you're going to be able to trim it down. You might not actually wanna trim it down this close because you're going to be stuffing this quite firmly and you wanna make sure that there is no chance of that, that seam opening. And you're gonna be using a tight running back stitch so probably the chances are fairly low, <clears throat> but you just don't want to really chance it. So 
Um, another thing, and you might have um, seen this in Nikki's Great Pattern for Mary Marie, see these little points here and here and here? Um, we want to make sure that those turn well. So even though they're sort of like, this is not bad, there's a little bit, this doesn't really come to a full point, you might want to just round that out a little bit with your Frixion. And you know, you're probably going to want to do this on the back, actually, because that's where you're going to be sewing. So you can actually see that coming through with the Frixion. Remember, the Frixion um, irons out with heat, and we're going to do that. You know, it's not a huge... It's not a huge um, curve you're making there, but you're just trying to make it a little bit um, a little bit bigger because when you stuff it, you're going to get a little bit of stress here and you wanna make sure that it turns and it stuffs and you don't get these sort of, um, sort of pulled and puckered areas. <clears throat> so we're going to be trimming out all of our pieces and I'm going to also tell you a little bit of a funny story. It's not really a story, but I think it's a little funny. You know, the, the feet on this doll are really kind of curious. And I thought, you know, these are just kind of odd, the way these are constructed. And I'm not an expert in flat cloth dolls, but I've only seen them really in another way. And here you have this little, the improved foot doll that's advertised. That's actually um, how this was trademarked and advertised. And I did a little mock-up of this foot <clears throat> in cloth just to see how it would work. Um, and it really is a nice little foot. And I would say it's definitely an improvement over um, some of the other uh, cloth doll feet that I've seen. So I will go away and we'll trim out these pieces. I'll come back and you're going to do the same thing actually with the, the heel or the boot sole. I'll come back and then I'll show you our next step. And our next step is going to be to sew the, um, the sole to the back of the doll's foot. And I'll show you how we do that. Uh, one other thing I just want to mention is when you're sewing with this, you're going to want, you know, this is you know your choice, but I think just for a final product, it's going to be much nicer. Um, and I know that um, for Mary Marie, this is the same instruction that Nikki provided, um, and I think it's a good one. You're going to be using a different color thread for several areas. Um, you're going to be using uh, sort of like if you have a dark, a dark uh, blonde or like a light brown for her hair. You're going to use a beige for her skin, white. You know, if you want to just run beige around here, I think that's probably fine. Um, but white for her um, combination, red for her stockings, and black for her boots. And the reason why you're going to do that is when you're stuffing this, you know, you're just going to pull a little bit. You might see some of your threads, even though you're using a very tight running back stitch. But you might see a little bit of your threads, and why not see, you know, a little bit of that color, that real color, rather than um, and rather than white, because that could be kind of jarring or even like a lighter color on these boots or here. Uh, just nice, it'll give you a nicer um, finished doll. So I will go away, I'll cut this out, and then I'll come back and show you how to do the boots. So we've cut out the front and the back. We've cut out the, the soles of the boots. And um, before, again, as mentioned, before we cut this out, we stay stitched around just the top of the head. It doesn't have to be an exact measurement on the front and the back within the seam allowance because we don't want those stitches to show. And that's really just going to provide some extra strength when we're pulling that opening open when we're stuffing um, the doll. So um, what we're going to do next is we're going to find the approximate center of the front of those boots. And we're going to want to make these markings on the back with Frixion, obviously, because that will iron out. And we're gonna do the same thing with the sole, uh, the boot sole. We're going to match the edges and we're gonna find the center toe front and the center heel. Um, so once we've done that, we'll also find the center on the back of this boot heel. And I wanna show you this little, um, it's not, it was done by hand and it was done quickly, but just show you this little um, mock-up I made just to sort of figure out how this thing came together um, before I cut it to my good, uh, into the good um, piece. And so it's basically, this is the back of the heel. And this is what we're doing now is we're attaching it from this point all the way around the back and we're aligning our center points, our center heel point and the center 
um, of the back of the boot. And we're also going to just make this a little bit easier. We're going to clip it. Make sure you don't clip it into the actual printed area, but just a little bit close to it. So we can basically get this to have a little bit of a stretch um, when we're wrapping it around the boot heel because it does take a little bit of maneuvering to do that. So what we're going to do, and we've already done it on this, uh, on this side, is matching that that uh, the back of the boot and the center back of the heel, we're gonna start to sew these two pieces together and we're gonna do our best to align the, the, the shapes, the, the sort of the curve here with this. And you so I've went over a little bit, that's probably okay just to go over a little bit, but on this side, I'm gonna try to do a much better job. And one of the things that um, I find is that I have a little light box and the light box helps me just to check my work. Um, you may, just to make this easier for yourself, you may want to just um, sew one side at a time because it's really difficult with all of these pins. Um, and you're gonna have to keep sort of like checking it and, and maneuvering it. When you sew, make sure, and this really um, is the same direction for every outline of the body, make sure that you're sewing you know, within that dark holding line that, um, in this case, um, it's a black line. Make sure you're sewing within that holding line because you don't want that holding line showing. On the bottom of the boots, it might not matter as much, but on the body where you've got the white and the flesh color, you don't want to see a black holding line. You want to go within that, that holding line. So when you turn it inside out, that holding line is going to be within your seam and not shown from the outside. So um, what I've done is I've used a very small, uh, in this case, I've used a back stitch because I want to make this extra strong, but you can use a running back stitch as long as it's a very tiny running stitch and it's a strong thread you're using. And as I discussed, I'm using a, um, a black thread here and I'm only using the black thread on the boot. When we start sewing the body together, I'll continue the black thread all the way up to the top of the boot and I'll stop it and I'll secure it make sure it's that uh, it's knotted and it's strong. And then I'll start again securing uh, and knotting a red thread. You could also, you know, knot this into your seam allowance if you don't want to have that little bump and run a red thread or use a red, red thread to do that running tight back stitch up until the point where we get to the white and then we'll switch to white thread. So basically the idea here, and I'm gonna show this to you when we get to putting the two pieces together. And we'll probably start with the head when we do that. And we'll work our way around the, the, the doll. So this will be in a couple of different steps, a couple of uh, future steps. But once we've sewn this together, we're going to trim, you know, I would probably trim just a little beyond that seam allowance again, because we don't want anything to pull. And this isn't going anywhere. I mean, this is a pretty strong, um, pretty strong seam. We're going to uh, trim it and we're going to clip everywhere you've got a curve on this doll. You wanna clip your seam allowance and you wanna make sure that you're not clipping into your stitching. Okay, that's really important, like a couple of threads away from your stitching so there's no chance that that's gonna pull open. So we're gonna do that on this side. And again, you know, I would say use a light box and I'll show you my light box, my light, little light panel when you're doing this. And again, we're only gonna be sewing from this point to the center. So this needs to remain open because the next thing that we're going to do when we've sandwiched the, when we place the right sides of the front and the back together is we're going to be sewing around the boot top and it's gonna create that boot, um, the boot shape. So I'm kind of uh, interested to see what this will look like in the real, in the on the real doll rather than my little um, sample. But it, that's basically the, that's basically the, um, the next step we're going to do. And once you've done that for both of your, your boots, we're going to move on to aligning and sewing together our fronts. And again, we're leaving this open. And I think just you know, from an approximate measurement, I'd say it's probably like two and a half inches that you're gonna leave that open. You know, you want enough room so you can sort of maneuver in there. Um, 
and uh, and we're cutting this a little bit at the top of this head between these lines. We're, we're giving ourselves a little bit more fabric. I mean, I think it's plenty, but once you've sort of trimmed this, you're gonna wanna leave a little bit more fabric here. And the reason for that is that this is gonna, again, this has the stasis, this is the area that's gonna get the most um, wear as you're stuffing. So I will um, put these front to back, I'll finish this boot. I'll put these front to back and I'll show you, basically, I might go down to, uh, I mean, right around the side and just show you how a one side looks when it's been stitched in those different, um, those different fabrics. So we're done with both of the feet. I just want to show you what they look like. We've trimmed around that seam allowance. We've clipped it so it'll turn easily. We've pressed open a little bit of the seam just at where we're going to be sewing these pieces together so there's no bulk there. And then when we turn that inside out, you can see what I was talking about just in terms of the structure. Um, basically what you're doing is you are, again, joining them, um, but you're making a complete sort of a complete foot shape. So what we're gonna do now is we are going to start to sew our pieces together. Now, this is something that I think, um, you know, if you're really comfortable with machine, you can do it by machine, but I just feel like maybe on the larger doll, the very largest doll, you could do it by machine if you basted it together and you made sure that it wasn't shifting around, but I'm doing a really tight back stitch here. You know, and if you can sew with a very small you know, running stitch, you could do this with a small running stitch, but you might want to do a running back stitch. So you actually give it a little bit of extra strength. So I'm using a gold thread for her, a goldish thread for her hair. And if you can see, I'm sewing um, inside that black line, as I discussed, and you just want to keep checking that front to back and making sure that those two things are aligned. You're going to want to pin it just, you know, for general alignment, because there's a little bit of, you know, positioning and stretching you're gonna have to do to get these pieces to meet. They're almost identical, but there's a little bit of uh, wiggle room there, a little bit of adjustment you might have to make. But you're gonna continue, I'm gonna continue doing this, and really just using the pins to hold the pieces together, checking. I'm going to get down to the bottom of the hairline here um, same way that I did it on the boot, I'm going to knot it, tie it off. I'm going to start a new thread, which is going to be my beige, and I'm going to do the neck. Then I'm going to use a white thread. I'm going to do the top of her um, combination, and then I'm going to continue on with the beige thread around the arm and then start with the white again. So um, I'm going to, as I said, I was going to complete one side, but I haven't done that. I'm going to go back, complete one side and, uh, and show it to you. And then, um, we can talk about how we're going to, um, uh, turn this inside out and the clipping and the trimming of the seams before we do that, um, how we're going to be matching up the, the boots. You know, it's really the same concept that we we did, we we're finding the centers and we're matching them and then just really making sure you're gonna to wanna to probably clip around this corner as well so it has a little bit of give. See, because this is a curved line, this is a straight line, you need to have a little bit of give on this. So I would clip into your seam allowance, again, not into the printing, um, but into your seam allowance, stopping short of the printing, and that will help you sort of to stretch and pull that so it, it actually meets, the curve meets this, sort of like you would with a, a curved um, uh, side seam on a, on a French fashion uh, three-piece back um, for a bodice. So I'll go away and I'll do that and we'll see progress. So here she is put together. I'm going to um, tell you that she is not exactly a mirror. The front and back are not exactly a mirror. So you're gonna have some areas where you're gonna have to use your better judgment. Um, so for example, here, I'm following along the front um, holding line and I did my best to match it, but it's a little bit off and that's, I think that's okay. You know, um, for the most part, you're going to get a pretty good match, but 
you know, just keep, when you're sewing it, just keep turning it, um, you know, once you've sort of aligned it by using a light box or the window or something and you've pinned it and held it in place, as you're sewing, just keep going back and forth and adjusting it as you, as you might need to. Um, here, this is the opening for the head. So we've trimmed down their seam allowance, but we've left that little bit extra on the top because again, this is most likely gonna be turned over when we're stuffing um, her and we just don't want that to fray. And we've already done our stay stitching as we had said before. So after she's been stitched together and you can see how funny her little feet look, we're going to be, um, we're gonna be turning her inside out. But before we do that, um, clip all of your curves. Again, make sure you don't clip into your, your actual stitching. Um, but wherever you've got an inside curve and even an outside curve, it's good just to give it a couple of clips. Inside is probably more important than outside. Um, between the legs, under the arms, you know, here and here, at the wrists, between the fingers. Um, you might want to uh, clip around the, the little feet. Um, something else I want to say is that when I went to piece the feet together, uh, and maybe this won't happen to you, but I'm just going to say that how I adjusted it. When I matched the foot and I sewed it down, there was not enough black in the front of the of the boot. So I've used a little bit of a permanent marker here to fill it in. Maybe that's not going to happen when you sew yours together um, because, you know, these are all printed, but they should be pretty consistent. If it does happen, you might want to just before you, you know, you might want to just try to match it up and see if you've got that little bit. You need a little bit more. You might want to just take a little black paint or a black marker and um, and fill in a little extra area at the top of that boot just to give her a little bit more of a foot. So um, we're now going to... Uh, turn her inside out with um, a hemostat, which is a great tool, and I'll show you how we can also use that when we're stuffing her. But we're going to turn her inside out. Um, we're just going to check once we've turned her inside out for any areas that we might need to reinforce or or just go back and re-sew. But for the most part, um, we'll be ready for stuffing. So she's been turned inside out, and very carefully we've... Um, pressed out with a blunt object. And I've got a little um, turning tool, which is made out of wood that doesn't have a sharp end. Um, we've um, poked out all of her, you know, her little toes and the, her heels and her fingers. And all the rest of this is pretty much going to come, um, get a little firmer and a little fuller uh, when you start to stuff. So, I'm going to show you uh, in the next step two different ways of actually stuffing her. Um, I'm going to see, uh, and then you can see how I filled in a little bit of that black. You know, you might want to just touch it up with a little black paint because this has a little bit of bluish cast because it's that permanent marker. Um, you know, just continue to work this out. And I'll go over that a little bit again. You might want to just take that tool and sort of like push out the seams a little bit. Again, they're going to come out when you stuff. So um, we're going to look at this two ways. We're, you know, when she's been stuffed, she's going to be a firm little solid um, girl. Um, but I think it might be interesting to try this, try a method that I think is um, from... Uh, Oh my goodness, I'm so bad with names. Uh, Edith Flack Ackley, um, or any really any other cloth doll um, uh, designer or manufacturer. Um, I'm going to try to stuff her, but I'm going to stuff her in such a way where I'm going to stuff her firmly up until about her knee. And then I'm going to run two rows of running stitches. And her knee's probably a little bit more like down here. I'm going to run two rows of running stitches, and I'll probably do that in a red so they um, they show up. And because it's going to be stuffed, I'm going to have a little bit of stuffing in there, but not so much where I'm not able to get a, um, a bend. So I'll show you that to you when we get to that. But um, again, you can stuff her as she is. Um, these dolls are um, 
are generally just sort of one piece, but it might be more interesting, more poseable, more playable if she has a little bit of movement. Um, I'm going to do that uh, at the knee. I'm going to do that at the hip. I'm going to do it to the shoulder. Maybe, uh, maybe here. I'm not sure that might, at this size, it might be too much. Um, in the much larger doll, um, I think that that would be nice that she could sort of sit in a chair or, you know, bend her arms a little bit. She's got little sort of <laughs> little squat arms. So we're going to start to, um, to stuff her again, stuffing her from the feet, making sure that they're very firm. Um, when I get to this point, I'll show you that maybe these two techniques. One is just really stuffing her firmly all the way. There will be no articulation, and the other one will try this articulation method. So we've started to stuff her, and we've been stuffing her from the, the boots up. And then we're going to do the arms, and then we're going to continue with the torso and go up to the head. But I just wanted to show you that, that uh, flexibility that I was talking about. Um, you may want to do this. You may not want to do this. If you stuff her very firmly all the way up, that's, that's great. But she's just going to, you know, basically stand. And I thought it would be kind of fun to give her a little bit of flexibility. You might not do this with the very smallest doll because it's so small, but I think there's something kind of nice about thinking about her sitting in a little chair or sitting on the ground, um, you know, and I want to show you how we did that. So basically, you're going to use quite a bit of fibrofill um, or stuffing or whatever you're using, cotton. Um, you're going to start again with the feet and you're going to stuff these really firmly. You can see there's some little wrinkles down here. You may not be able to get rid of those no matter how hard you stuff because of the way the fabric is, is stretching. But um, in terms of the, the putting a joint in, what I've done is I've stuffed really firmly up until about, I guess, maybe, you know, a quarter of an inch away from where I want that that um, knee bend to be. And then I've stuffed very lightly. And then <clears throat> what I've done is I've done a, a stab stitch using a matching um, thread or matching red thread in this case, white in this case. Um, and I've taken, I've buried my um, knot. I've tied it off to make sure it's secure. And then I've done a tiny stab stitch, a running stab stitch all the way through. It's not so great on the back, but um, you know, you, you can just be very careful when you do this. Uh, so basically that creates a little, a little bend. And then once that seam has been sewn, you continue to stuff really firmly. And then once you get up to where you want that hip um, joint to be, you do the same thing. You stuff lightly, and then you're going to do your st running stab stitch. So it creates this like, you know, she can, she can sit and she can bend her legs. And um, as I said, I might do, I think I'm going to do the shoulders. I'm not sure about the elbows. It might just be overkill, um, but that might be kind of fun too, you know, to give her a little bit of um, little bit of flexibility if you want to play with her that way. The other thing I want to show you is the, and I'm just actually going to take some of the stuffing out because I'm almost ready to do my seam here. So these hemostats are so great. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with these, but for turning out things, um, long things, but basically you can also use it to distribute stuffing um, or your fill. So you just grab a little ball and you don't want to go too large with these because you want to be able to distribute it and sort of get it to, to sit where you want. And you kind of use that hemostat to guide the stuffing where you want it to be. In this case, you know, I think that that's probably pretty much ready to stitch up, but I also sometimes will take a blunt object. I'm using a pencil here, but I have another tool that has a blunt end. Never use a sharp end because you don't want to go through your fabric and don't use anything that's going to mark your fabric, obviously. I mean, I wouldn't use a pencil normally, but I'm just sort of like really packing it in there. And then I'm going to, I've used a Frixion just to lightly trace, you can iron it out later, where I want that, um, that joint to be. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put a pin here to keep keep my layers together. It doesn't have to be any exact place because you've already drawn that line where you're going to do your stitching. And I'm going to, again, using a running stab stitch, in this case in white or in beige, I'm going to do her, her, hip, uh, her hip joint. And then I'm going to continue stuffing up. I'll probably stop about here. Um, and then I'll do the arms. Or I'll do the arms 
do the, the shoulder joints, maybe the elbow joints, and then continue stuffing up all the way through the head. And then I'll show you how we will deal with the, the head closure. Um, so let's just see here. And you can see that we've kept a little bit extra up here because there's a little bit of fraying. If you really want to, just to make it a little easier for yourself, you might want to take this um, seam allowance and maybe baste it down or just sort of think think about this like a pastry bag you know when you're filling a pastry bag um you just want to make sure that you've got a you're not having any impediments when you're um when you're sewing this together so i might just like put a little uh basting stitch here and here just to keep it open until i've gotten up to that point then i'll take the basting stitches out so i'm going to continue um with this i'm also going to try to figure out i've bought several bags of this polyfill uh, this is 93 ounces. I'm going to try to figure out how much each doll needs uh, because these little dolls, you'll be surprised, um, use a lot of stuffing because they just really, you know, they need to be firmly stuffed. Um, and again, uh, if you're wanting to use cotton, that's fine. It's just a little bit more expensive. Um, but I think the fiber fill really has a good soft feeling to it and it's quite um, easy to work with. So I'm going to continue this and I will come back and show you how we deal with the head closure. So she's been stuffed pretty fully. You know, when I was taking a look at the the arms and how her her thumbs are kind of like in a strange place. You know, she's sort of like this. Um, the the articulation at the elbows just didn't seem to make any sense. I mean, uh, at the shoulders didn't seem to make much sense. So I think that, you know, she can sit now, which is pretty great. Um, and she could sit on a chair, you know, because she can bend her leg. I don't know if I would actually articulate anymore. Um, maybe on the larger doll, um, the very largest doll, I might do that. But, you know, you're going to you're gonna have this little bit of trickiness at the, the neckline. Um, the only way I've really seen to do that is to stuff really firmly, and then you might need to just have that have the fold at the back of the neck so you're not getting at the front. You're gonna have to probably keep, you might put a little tack stitch there or something and hold it back, but you're gonna have to keep stuffing down until you can get that, you know, get rid of that wrinkle, but it's pretty problematic with all of these types of dolls to get that wrinkle. So we, we stuffed the arms, then we stuffed the rest of the, t the torso um, very firmly. Um, we stuffed the head very firmly. And then what we did was we took, a, using a ladder stitch, we started to close up the head. And then when we got about halfway, we put in more um, stuffing. We just, I'm, I'm probably gonna put in just another ball just to really, you know, give her that round head. You know, and it's kind of interesting because she has a perfectly round head, but look, you know, it was sewn round, but it's just difficult to get that roundness. Um, I kind of like a little bit of that irregularity because it looks like it's hair, but um, you know, she's got a, <laughs> she's got a big head, um, and uh, it takes a lot of stuffing. So you know, once that's been closed up, what I started to do, and again, this is totally up to you, is do a, just a tiny little bit bit of needle sculpting. So. If you notice here, if, um, if I had shown this to you before I did the needle sculpting, I've taken some little anchoring stitches in the corner of the eyes and I've made sure that they were, you know, in a thread color that sort of blended into the cloth. And I did some anchoring stitches and then I, I passed my needle through and I did some other anchoring stitches and, you know, before anchoring, I should say, and pulled them so they can kind of come together a little bit. And then I took the same, I did the same thing with the nostrils. I did the same thing with the corners of the mouth and with a little bit one on the chin. So it looks like she's got a little bit of a, a, a dimple or at least a chin there. I mean, I probably should have used like a dark brown here and maybe a slightly darker color here, but I'm using like, um, uh, you know, a beige color and I just for demonstration purposes. Um, it also would be kind of fun to do a little needle sculpting on her hands. I mean, they are, you know, they're in kind of an odd position, but um, if you just do the same thing that we were doing, let's say here, with a little stab stitch, running stitch and pull it up, you're going to get some nice little articul articulation in those fingers. And we don't really have that here. Um, it probably will be more evident again in the larger doll. So I'm going to sew her up and um, 
and finish the needle sculpting on this hand. And then we will move on to her petticoat. So her party dress is very, very simple to make. You have two back yoke pieces, one front yoke piece. When you cut this, it might be, it's gonna be cut on the fold. You might wanna to try to position one of the flower bunches sort of in the middle. Um, it might be pretty, but you can really, again, it's your choice. Um, I'm just gonna iron this out a little bit. Um, just so you know, this is like a, a lightish weight. I think it's like a wool blend. Um, it really has a beautiful hand. Maybe it even has a little linen in it. I'm not sure, but it kind of feels like wool to me. I'll have to ask Michael to confirm. Um, but basically, it's got a lot of drape. So if you want something to be a little bit more stable, you might want to spray it with or treat it with Terriol Magic or another fabric stabilizer. I kind of cheated and used a little spray starch, but I, you know, I'm not really happy. Um, but the spray starch helped to stabilize it a little bit and make, give it a little more body. So, but it's very stretchy. And like all the fabrics I seem to work with, it frays really easily. So you don't want to handle it that much. So what you're going to do is you're going to stitch your shoulder seams and you're going to trim those shoulder seams and you're going to overcast. You're using a quarter inch seam allowance for that. And then you're going to stay stitch. And I'm doing this by machine. You can see how wonky that is because machine is not my favorite thing, but it's great that, you know, the machine was being used at this time because it makes it so much faster to work with. But I'm going to probably do some hand sewing just in terms of finishing here. So you're going to run um, within your quarter inch seam allowance, you're going to run a stay stitch around the neckline so it just doesn't stretch as you're handling it. And then you're going to put it on your doll. And I think you're going to see there's much in the pattern. There's, there's a bit left over. You're just going to guesstimate when you put it on your doll, your overlap. And you should have like at least a half an inch to a quarter of an inch overlap in the back. And then once you've, you've determined that, um, you're going to fold that over and you're going to slip stitch it or hem it down in place and give it a good press. So the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking our neck trim and this is going to be um, sewn, uh, this is on the bias. We're going to be pressing up, and I might even want to press up a little bit more of the seam allowance. Uh, the dimensions will be provided in your, in your pattern. You know, this is probably more like a three eighths or so because I just don't want it to be very thick. So I'll finish doing that later. So you're gonna press up your seam allowance um, on one long end, or edge rather, you're going to then form this into a very gentle curve and just give it a press to keep that gentle curve. It's not gonna be a tight circle. You just wanna have a little curve to help it um, go around the neckline. Maybe I will just finish this little bit here. You know, you can mark this out if you want. I'm just sort of eyeballing it and you can always make adjustments when you do your fold over. So you're going to find the center of your bias trim. You're going to match the center of your uh, front uh, neckline, and then you're going to pin it and sort of pull it a little bit as you're going around the curve. When you get to the end, you're gonna fold this over, fold over the additional and press it. And then you're gonna stitch that around with a quarter inch seam allowance. And then like with any other binding, you're then going to turn it over. You might wanna trim um, down this seam allowance a little bit. You're gonna turn it over, turn it over again, and you're going to slip stitch it with tiny stitches in place from the back, just to give this little contrasting uh, neckline. Because what we're really doing here is we're picking up some of the colors that are in the darker, darker colors in the, in the flowers. And then there'll be some ribbon trim on her dress that will match this as well or be close to this. So I'm going to go away and do that. Um, and again, <laughs> look, these are fraying. So try not to handle them too much. I feel like I say that in every single one of these videos. But um, that's just one of the things about working with beautiful natural fabrics is they tend to fray a little bit. So I'm going to go away um, and do that. The next step will be to gather our front panel to fit the front. And then before we gather the back panel, we're going to create a finished placket in the center of that and I'll show you that step as well. It's very simple. And for those of you who have done the Mary Marie um, dresses, it's the same technique that um, 
that Nikki introduced or Nikki described, uh, where you're laying a facing on the right side of the material, you're stitching around the opening, you're clipping the opening, you're turning it inside the garment, you're, you're turning under your seam allowances and you're basically using tiny stitches, trying to make them invisible, sewing that panel to the wrong side. So I will show that to you um, in the first step after I've done the, the neckline and I've gathered this and we can probably kill two birds with one stone. So our back and front panels, <clears throat> excuse me, are identical. They're, they're actually the very same size, but they're gonna be treated a little differently. The back panel, and just so you know, this fabric does have a right and a wrong side. <laughs> it might take a little while to figure out which is which, but there's a brighter side and a sort of a washed out side. You could use either side. I mean, maybe the washed out side might look a little bit more authentic, but um, for the back panel, in your pattern, you're going to see there's a, a dimension given for this little facing piece. You're gonna cut that out. You're going to find the center and you're going to draw out the height of that opening on the center with a friction. And then um, right side to right side, you're going to sew very close to this line. You're gonna take a couple of stitches across the bottom and then go up on the other side. You're gonna very carefully clip down the center and you're gonna clip into your corners and then you're gonna turn everything of uh, this piece um, to the inside. And once you've turned it to the inside, you're going to give it a little press and then you're gonna turn under your seam allowance on all three edges and you're gonna sew it down with a little hem stitch. I made mean, tiny stitches so you don't see them from the front, but um, that's gonna give you a nice finished um, placket. What we're going to do with the front, and we're not done with the back yet, but what we're gonna do with the front is this is our yoke front. We're going to run within the quarter inch seam allowance, we're gonna run two rows of gathering stitches. Now, I like to actually, um, when I'm doing machine sewing, I like to leave both ends open, or rather don't backstitch one end. Um, I'd just like to leave some long threads. And then once I have those long threads, what I'm going to do, I'm not gonna pull it up yet, I'm gonna find the center of this I'm gonna match it to the center of this, and then I'm gonna pull it up so these points align with the armholes. And then we're going to uh, right sides to right sides. Once this has been gathered up and we've distributed the gathers as we want them, we're going to sew this with a quarter inch seam allowance. We're going to trim it, we're going to overcast it, and we're gonna press it. And I think probably press it down, but you'll have to see how, how this fabric behaves. It still has a little bit of a has body and it. it's a li little bit on the sheer side, but um, then we're going to do the same on the back. And the way we're gonna do that, we imagine that this has already been finished. You're going to gather them up as two separate pieces. So starting from your finished edge of your opening, you're gonna align this, uh, this edge of this opening or that side of the opening of the back. You're going to pull up your stitching to fit this you're going to seam it, you're going to trim it, overcast it, and press it. You're gonna do that on both sides. And then we're gonna be ready for the sleeves. So I'm gonna go off and do those, those steps. I'll come back, I'll show you um, the, the sort of the finished front and back. And then we're going to, um, and perhaps I'll even move on to some of the steps on the sleeve so you can see how that's put together, but it, very, very simple. So, the front skirt with the dress front has been attached to the front yoke, gathered to fit. You can't see it, but there are two corners here, and those corners were brought in to fit that opening or that, that edge. We did the same thing with the back. And you can also see how the back has been finished with that placket. That's a it's a very simple way of doing something to get a nice finished clean edge. So what we're going to do now is we are going to work on our sleeves and 
there's some things we need to do the sleeves before we can put them on or attach them. But we're going to make a very narrow hem on the long bottom edge. You can see that. This isn't very narrow, I guess. This is more like an eighth of an inch or something, but um, a narrow hem. And then we're going to find, like we did before, we're going to find the center of that. Let me see if I have a pin here. Oh, I have pins right here. We're going to find the center of that sleeve. And then we've run two rows of gathering stitches. We haven't gone all the way out. We're going a little bit in. So it's really just gathering that sleeve cap. And then we're going to find our center shoulder seam or match the center shoulder seam with this seam. Okay, so we know that that's centered. So now I'm going to left both ends of the stitching open, of the gathering rather open. I did not tie it off. I'm just going to separate these threads so we actually know what we're pulling. Okay. Then taking both of those threads, we're just going to ease this together. It's not a very, there's not very much that you need to gather, but basically what you're trying to do, and let me get these threads out of the way here. You're trying to match up the edge of the sleeve with the edge of the skirt. And as I said, what I sort of plums like to do is leave those you're going to concentrate your gathers up towards the top of the sleeve cap and then you're just going to basically <laughs> if i can get my fingers out of the way you're going to basically match your raw edges pin it securely you just have to make sure you're matching them you don't want to have any uh, gaps or anything see it's not really a tight it's not really a tight gather. There's just gonna be some fullness up there. And you're gonna do the same thing here. And what I sometimes like to do, maybe I already had done this, is just pin it at that edge. And then again, separating those top threads from the bottom, or at least the section we're pulling, just pulling them up a little bit. You know, if you really wanted to, you could also tie them off. I just don't think this is really going anywhere, but you could tie off your threads. Gosh, I sometimes can't stand having such short fingers. You tie your threads off. You know, just knot them a little bit, a couple of times. Again, they're not gonna go anywhere. You've pinned it in place, but you once you've done this, you can, you know, you can sort of take a, a pin if you want and sort of adjust your gathers and you know maybe there's a slightly different way that you want to do them or have them more concentrated but I sort of like to have them concentrated towards the top and then we're going to do the same thing here I'm going to tie off our threads let's go here I don't know about you guys but I keep getting my eyes checked because I swear <laughs> I'm getting blinder and blinder. There we go. Okay. Yep. So we might want to pull that down a little bit, distribute that down. It's such a, you know, you're going to have a, it's going to be much easier on the, on the larger version of this dress and probably a little trickier on the smaller version of the dress because it's going to be for this tiny little doll. But okay. So we might like trim these off just so they don't get in the way when we stitch this. And we're gonna sew this in place with a quarter inch seam allowance. We're going to um, then trim our seam, we're going to overcast it. And actually these ended up being pressed up. So you might wanna just take a pin and run it through that side to keep those, those front seams lying flat. There we go. So very simple, you're just gonna run this through and then once we've done that and we've given it a nice, we've pressed it out a little bit and we don't wanna press you know, these, these poofy gathers um, 
flat, we're going to match seam, sleeve edge, underarm seam, and our skirt together, sides together. And we're going to stitch that with a quarter inch seam allowance all the way up to the top. And do the same thing, trim, um, overcast. Sometimes I like to take a little clip in the underarm just to ease it out a little bit. And then once we've done that, we'll do the other sleeve. Then we'll fit it to our doll. And um, I am waiting for some ribbon to arrive and then I'm going to show you how we treat the sleeves, but the, um, the next few steps are we're going to hem this. We're going to put in our back closure of two hooks and two thread loops. And when I have the ribbon, I will show you how we're going to finish these. The last uh, finishing touch is going to be a really wide ruffle that's going to go around the front and arch over the sleeves and end at the center back. So we'll get to that in a couple of steps. So our sleeves have been set in. We've pressed them. Uh, this fabric has quite a bit of memory. You're gonna find out it kind of <laughs> stands out a little bit, but that's good because it'll be nice and sort of um, blousey when we get that frill around the neckline. What we're gonna do now is we're going to match our underarm sleeve, the edge of the sleeve, our underarm seam, I'm a little tired today, and our raw edges, the long edges of the side. And we're gonna sew that together with a quarter inch seam allowance. We're going to trim it, we're gonna to overcast it, and as I said, I, we're going to take a little clip, just a little clip there to ease underneath that arm. And we're gonna do that on both sides. Then we'll put the dress on the doll and determine our closures determine our closures and determine our hem length and then we will hem it. So that is our next step and I will come back and show you progress. So the sleeves have been set in and just have tried the dress on her. One thing about the 1890s, especially I think for little girls, is their dresses were quite long. Um, you know, in the 1880s, they might have been up here around the knees. Maybe they would have shown a little bit of the, the pantalettes or the underwear, but they were shorter. Here, they're sort of like, they're, they're longer. And I think that one thing that, you know, um, Michael Kanata says, and I think it's really true, is that fashion is always looking back. If you sort of look at this time period, um, sort of the Kate Greenway style, it's sort of like a, a nod back to the um, 1790s, um, you know, early, early 1800s, uh, where the bodice was high, the, the skirt was long, the sleeves were sometimes, you know, short. Um, 1890s, a lot of the time there was a as you probably already know, there's a big puff sleeve and then it was tighter down to the wrist, but this is a little girl. And, um, and we just want her to like have this little party dress. So um, I've marked up the hem where I think it should be. And I think you should try it on your doll, but I think it's really like almost to like the, what is that? The top of the instep, I think they call that, you know, that long. It could probably be even a little bit longer um, because that's the style of that time. So um, we've also fitted in the back. We're going to put in our hooks and our eyes, our thread loops rather. Um, and we're going to press up. I've actually um, used a pinking shears or a scallop shears on this fabric because it just, it, it frays so much. We're gonna turn under um, probably about a half an inch or a quarter of an inch. And then we're gonna do a deep hem all around that bottom. So the next step we're going to do after we've done that is we're going to do the neck ruffle and I'll come back and show that to you. But um, I have her on her stand, probably would be better if I had her off just so she would lie a little bit flatter. Yeah, you see like, it's kind of almost like a little bit of a nightgown shape, but that's sort of like um, the way that I think these, uh, these children were dressed, you know, um, a little bit looser, not as confined. 
Um, I don't think they were using uh, training corsets at this time in the in history. I may be wrong about that, but I think it's sort of, again, looking back to the late 18th century when that was um, espoused um, for children, that they would have more natural, um, comfortable clothing. So I will hem this and I will come back when we start to talk and work on the neck ruffle, which is going to go here and go up over the shoulders. It's a very common um, 1890s uh, decorative element for children's clothing. So we're preparing the ruffle that goes around the yoke and over the shoulders of our dress. And according to the dimensions on your pattern for either one of the three sizes of the doll, you're going to um, cut this out on the straight. You're going to uh, turn a narrow hem and sew a narrow hem around the uh, one of the long edges, the bottom edge. You're going to hem the short edges and then you're going to turn the top over and follow your pattern instructions for that dimension as well. But you're going to turn the top over. And what I suggest is that before you do that, and perhaps even when you're cutting out the strip, cut out that top edge with a pinking shears. The reason why we're going to do that is that, again, this fabric frays pretty easily. And as you're pulling up your gathers, which you're going to do next, you're going to run two rows of gathering stitches and also follow the pattern for where those are placed. You're going to be running two rows of gathering stitches across that top folded edge. As you're pulling that, you don't want all of these threads to come up and just, it's just, um, you don't want, you want to save yourself some time from going back and having to um, clip things and, and do other things that you normally wouldn't want to do. Um, or save yourself the time. Um, one thing that I just also want to say with this fabric is that it is, um, it has a memory. So it's not like a cotton where you fold it and you press it and it just presses up really crisply. Um, you need to spray it, you need to mist it, um, and then press it with a very hot iron in order to get a good um, sharp crease. And you can see um, that here. Um, you might have to do that on the front and the back just to get a nice sharp um, edge. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna find the center of our, like we've been doing before, we're gonna find the center of our yoke ruffle. We're gonna place that center on our yoke ruffle and then we're gonna very gently bring and gather up the gathers to fit around the front, the shoulders, and to the back. This short end should be aligned exactly with the back opening. Um, you already put your, if you were to put your hooks and your eyes in there, uh, you might have one side stop short. Um, if you haven't put your hooks and eyes in yet, uh, you can sew this down and you can just put your, your, um, your thread loops, I should not have said eyes, your thread loops on one side. So um, I'm gonna show you how uh, that looks when it's been gathered up, but we're not gonna sew it down yet. Once we've got it um, gathered to the, the length we want, we're going to pin it down to the board and we're gonna get our steam iron and we're going to steam those uh, gathers um, in place just to have them set and we'll let that dry. And then we can go back in and, and do it because I think this is, again, this fabric has a lot of memory. It's going to be really frilly. There's nothing wrong with frilly. If you like frilly, that's fine. But I prefer when something has a little bit more of a set and it's not all over the place. So we'll go away and we'll do that and come back and show you that steaming process. So we've gathered up the yoke ruffle and we've just basically pinned it in place just to see We'll check on the length, first of all, and just to actually see if we like the way the, the ruffles are distributed, or the gathers are distributed, rather. And then once we've got that where we want it to be, I'm going to take this little pin out, we're going to pin it to our pressing mat, or you could do this on your ironing board, too. I don't think it necessarily needs to be a pressing mat, but that pressing mat is just so helpful. And I'm gonna probably do this on the diagonal because I probably need a little bit more room. 
So what you're basically going to do is just pin it at the top in a straight line. And once you've done that, sort of getting your, your ruffles all sort of like, you know, this probably could be distributed a little bit better, but I'm doing this again for, a uh, for demonstration purposes. And you're going to just get that as straight as you possibly can get it. You know, it's not going around a straight shape, but it's always nice to have a little bit of, of something to go by and make sure that it's it feels like it's this probably needs to this probably needs to be adjusted just a little bit yeah and again we've got our long threads no need for you to tie these off I mean with with hand gathers I think it's important to do that because generally it's not as tight a gather and this fabric is actually quite um, tight. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be then sort of just arranging, you know, we're not sewing down this edge, but we just want to sort of arrange the ruffles or the ruffle rather, or the gathers or the folds at the bottom as we might want them to, to appear. You're going to do that all the way across the bottom. You know, and when it goes on, it's going to, it's going to fall slightly differently, but this is just basically keeping this sort of nice, you know, you're setting your, your gathers, um, and we're setting your ruffle in a way that it's going to have a little bit of a more tidy, you know, 19th century appearance. So once you've done all of that, you're going to take this over to your steam iron and using your steam iron in full steam, you're going to hover above this and you're going to give it a couple of good bursts of steam and then you're going to let it set and you're just going to try to let it sort of dry. So, you know, the, again, the fabric has a memory, so it sort of just will, sort of keep these ruffles a little bit more um, orderly. Now, I like to press everything. I mean, and that sometimes, I know that when these things were first made, they probably were pretty frilly and, and, um, and exuberant, as Michael says. But I, I don't know, I like, I like things to have a little bit of a, um, an, a little bit of form. So I'm just going to do this, but you know, if you don't want to do it, let, let your ruffles be roughly. And, um, and I think that that's fine too, because when these things were first made, I'm sure they were pretty, pretty frilly and pretty roughly. Um, and that's, um, that's fine. But again, I, I, I do like that look. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to, I already put in my, the hooks, we're going to, fit the doll at the back for our thread loops, but we'll probably do that after the um, after the ruffle's been put on because we're gonna be going through the header of that ruffle with one thread loop. And then I'm going to show you um, the treatment for the sleeves. And then we're gonna go into our, um, our ribbon embellishment. So we've done quite a few things since we um, had steamed our neck ruffle rather our yoke ruffle, I keep calling it neck ruffle, but our yoke ruffle. Um, I'm starting to just have some fun with this, this ribbon that I got from the Carmel doll shop. Um, I'm using it just as a very simple embellishment, sort of like, you know, this is supposed to be like a um, mommy made garment of the 1890s. Um, so I'm actually using it just sort of like um, threading it through the, between the um, the hem or capturing it within the hem so it doesn't go to the other side. But I think if you went to the other side, it would be perfectly fine. Um, I'm using it here. I used it on the, uh, the yoke ruffle just to give it a little bit of a finish, 
um, and some sort of, I guess, a little whimsy and a little color. Um, I also used it to tie these two little bows here. Very, very simple. Um, just basically threading a length of ribbon, um, knotting it, and tying a bow. So it's not really a constructive bow, it's just a very simple bow. I might take a little piece, uh, I might tack these down a little bit so they don't come apart. And then um, where I've started my ribbon trim, I'm probably gonna fold that back and tack that down, do the same thing on both ends. In terms of the back, I haven't put my hooks and eyes, uh, my, I put my hooks in, but not my thread loops. I'm going to tack this down just probably at the bottom so it doesn't fly away. Um, and then I'm just gonna continue that around. I also just wanted to show you um, sort of how the, the sleeve came up. So you can see here, the sleeve is not gathered. What I did was I took a, um, uh, I took a double thread, not a double row, just a double thread of strong thread, and I ran um, running stitches or gathering stitches probably about a quarter of an inch above that little hem, and I pulled it in to fit her arm. And what I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to do the same thing that I did here. I'm probably gonna take a, uh, a length of ribbon, run it through, tie it, and tie a little bow there and tack that down too. Um, Cause I think that would be pretty to have a little color on her, um, on her arm. So this is pretty much um, her party dress. And um, you know, you could see that it's, it's that very typical um, 1890s sort of like young uh, child's dress that's long and has the sort of the high waist and the yoke um, and the full sleeves, etc. So I hope that you enjoy this. I'm going to be making a version of this, a larger version for the largest size doll as this doll comes in three sizes. And for the very smallest one, I think I'm gonna do a simple nightgown because this is, for a tiny little doll, this is a lot going on. I think a little nightgown would be really cute on that tiny little doll. So it's a doll for a doll. And she's probably a doll for a doll too. So um, I will come back and show you uh, the progress or the next steps on those items. Here's the finished dress, her little party dress. Um, as we talked about it's been trimmed with this narrow silk ribbon. I think that the ribbon, you know, you could put it on before you actually um, steam and put the um, uh, steam and set the the yoke frill. But I also think it kind of helps to like, you know, you pulls it in a little bit um, if you actually apply it later. And then what I also did was in the back, I ran a ribbon from underneath the arms, at the, at the underarm seam on both sides, I ran that same ribbon through just to pull up a little bit of the fullness in the back because she, it's a quite a full dress and she's already a, a little bit of a chunky girl. So we just wanted to give her a little bit more of a waistline. Uh, so here she is. And again, because she is jointed, she can sit, um, she can hold the smaller doll or she can sit with the larger doll when, um, when she's finished. But uh, this is, this is the, the party dress. And you know, feel free to make this in a whole bunch of different fabrics. I mean, this one's quite sheer. What I, what I didn't show you is actually also her little petticoat. Very, very simple. It's in the instructions. I haven't really given an instructional video for it, but very simple to make. Um, Probably the most time consuming thing is whipping the um, the lace onto the hem, but just a very simple, you know, rectangle gathered up into a waistband and the directions are in your, and the measurements are in your directions and a little button um, and button loop, thread loop. So there she is, ready to run around and eat sugar plums and do whatever else she was gonna do on Christmas. So we'll be back with the cape and with the tam. So I had talked a little bit about these, the construction of these feet. Um, <laughs> I'm making the larger one now. I made the smaller one and I had described how the sole, um, how do I put this? The front of the boot runs a little short in terms of the printing, at least I found it did. And I found that on the smaller one, I found it on the larger one, so I have a feeling that it's just part of this, the design of this, the original design. 
So what I want to show you is that I basically just extended the um, area of the front of the boot. There's no printing on it. It's just the muslin or the poplin color. I extended that all the way to the, and sewed it all the way all around the line of the front of the boot um, uh, sole. So the reason why I did that was, you know, I wanted the boot to extend um, and I wanted to have a, a, a nicer feeling. So what I'm doing now, and I'm sort of experimenting with this, I tried a little bit of pen on the smaller doll. I didn't really like the look of that because the pen ink was a little bit blue. So what I'm doing is I'm watering down some black acrylic paint and I'm using it, not too watery, because you could see it sort of like can bleed into the rest of your, your soul. But I'm kind of, I'm using that just to touch up the top of the boot or the, the toe of the boot. And, you know, you just want to make sure, I'm sure a lot of you people are great doll artists and painters. Painting <laughs> is not my specialty, even though I did some of it years ago in school. So you basically, what I'm sort of doing here is I'm just sort of making like a faux, kind of think of this as like a little toe piece that might have been on these types of boots. And I would say, you know, practice See, I already got a little bit on there, which is fine. You're not going to see the bottom of that. But I would say practice on a piece of muslin just to see, or a piece of the fabric, scrap piece of the fabric, just to see the type of coverage you want to get. And, you know, try to make them symmetrical. So the larger doll, who's about 16 inches, is done. I don't think you could see her all on the camera. She's so big. But I did want to show you um, the idea of using old white work or vintage, you know, under things for her petticoat. Uh, this is actually something I got on eBay. And, you know, I felt a little bit bad cutting it up, but I just thought, you know, it's just, it was in very good shape. I mean, there is some like damage or fraying with the um, embroidery at the bottom, but the tucks are really beautiful and the fabric was nice and firm. I'm probably gonna use it for um, a couple of other like doll projects, undergarments, et cetera. I probably could get another three things out of it. But um, this just shows you like what you can, you can do with some of these things if you've got a piece or, or another um, scrap of something that will give you enough fabric to make um, a petticoat. And it's the, it'll be in the instructions. Um, you'll have instructions either for um, a uh, uh, using a piece like this, or making this out of um, batiste or any other type of um, good cotton you have for uh, for the petticoat. So, um, but this is great because it already came with all of these beautiful tucks, and um, and all we had to do is just really cut it out, gather it. Uh, put on a waistband and do a um, and do a button and a thread loop at the back and then we're pretty much done. Um, did a little bit more um, sort of ornamentation here. I'm going to add a bow to her head but because she's got a little bit more that needs to be covered it's a little bit it's again it's a little bit more. Um, actually I'm gonna just iron this down a little bit. You know I like everything flat I know. Um, so there she is. We're going to um, move on to the cape and the tam now uh, for both size dolls. And actually the small size doll looks like she's 10 inches. So you're looking at a 10 inch doll and a 16 inch doll. And I don't really quite know the size of the very smallest doll yet, but I can imagine and she's about probably about six um, inches. So um, we'll move on to that and then I'll come back and show you uh, the the elements for the cape and the tam. So the tam is very, very simple to make. Um, you've got a one piece for your outer fabric. You've got your lining. I've already basted these together 
outside of the, um, the quarter inch seam allowance. And then you've got a headband or a headband, a hat band. And what you're going to do is you're going to cut it to the height shown in the pattern, but then you're also going to measure your doll's head and add a half an inch to that uh, measurement around your doll's head um, where the hat will sit and because they're all they're all going to come um, out a little bit different probably based on the amount of stuffing you use and how you shape them so what we're going to do is we're going to press this in half and if you see the way I've tried to cut this this is the folded edge will be the bottom of the of the band I've tried to like position this in a way where I would have a little bit of um, of a, a dark border along the bottom. I just think that would be a nice finishing touch. I fold it in half and I've pressed it. And then I'm going to take, let's see which side is which. This is going to be the inside. I'm going to fold up and press down our quarter inch seam allowance. You know, I love working with, um, I love and I hate working with plaid, I guess. I love working with plaid because it's easy to find your lines, you know, to keep a straight line because you've already got the lines woven into the fabric. I hate mashing plaid, um, which is really difficult to do, I think. But um, if you also, when you're cutting out your tam, you can see there's, this is just the sample I used a little bit that went into the, the selvage part uh, of the fabric. But you're, it would be nice just to try to align your pattern if you want to. I mean, the way this is going to end up in the hat might be, you know, the pattern might be running this way, it might be running this way, but I think it's nice just to give yourself some symmetry. And then when we're actually sewing it together, you know, if this works out well, you can actually create sort of an alignment for yourself. This is probably not going to show because what we're going to do now you know, you might just use this for positioning. You know, this is the center, you know, this is the center. Um, we're gonna be running a double row of gathering stitches around the brim. And we're going to then put short ends together with a quarter inch seam allowance. So our short seam, we're gonna press that open. And then once this is gathered, we're gonna gather it to fit the inside opening of our band and you're gonna be doing right side to right side. Let's see, okay. So let's say you're using that as your center. You know, it also might be good for you to, you know, if you really wanna be exact, you can, um, you can divide this. This is your center back seam. This is your center front. And then you know you're gonna have two sides. So this actually, the pattern's actually helping you a bit. Um, and then you might do, do the same thing for here. So when you're distributing your gathers, you can distribute them equally, like you would sometimes when you're pulling up a skirt or a ruffle. Um, it just helps you to, um, to divide up and keep an eye on things and distribute things. So we're going to be running our gathering stitches. Um, after we've done that, we're going to put right sides to right sides. And again, I'm gonna try to follow my own direction. You're gonna put a right side, oh, you know what? And of course, I didn't do this right. Oh, no, I did. I always have to question myself. Um, we're going to, again, gather it to fit the band once it's been formed together. And then we're going to sew the band, this unpressed edge with a quarter inch seam allowance to the top of the, um, of the tam. And then we're going to be turning under like you would with a cuff or anything else, you're gonna be turning this under and you're gonna be capturing that sewn edge, that gathered edge within the hat band itself. So you might wanna trim it a little bit just to give it a little less bulk. And then you're going to slip stitch the inside to the, the stitching line of the inside of your lining. And that's, as, that's pretty much as simple as it gets. So um, I'm going to go away and do those things and then show you um, how we can trim it. There's the finished tam. Uh, again, very, very simple. Just two circles, one um, your outer fabric, one a lining with a, um, a band of the same material, or you can make that a contrasting material if you wanted. Just gathered, um, you set this on like you would a waistband, um, exactly like you would a waistband, uh, and it's just very, very simple.
you know, it's going to be a little snug to her head if you need you can always push it in a little bit. She's not going to be damaged in any way. She can take it. Um, and I just decided to um, run a band of black soutache um, around the brim just to give it a little bit of an accent. And then because I had a thousand beads left over from the project, I put a little bead on top of her, her, um, her tam. So there you go. I mean, very, again, very simple. And I think that this probably could also be used as a as a sailor or mariner um, hat, if you wanted. I think that would be really cute um, in blue, um, with maybe with like red trim or something and a little star. But um, again, a very popular style of this time. Um, I like to have it a little bit flatter, but you can poof it up if you want. Um, but I like to have a little bit flatter and maybe, you know, a little bit lower in the front than it is in the back. Um, so she has like a little rakish um, Scottish air to her. So um, we will show her with the cape and you can see how it all comes together. So the cape components are very, very simple. I've already started to work on them, but you've got um, an outer piece and you've got your lining. They're exactly the same, cut out of exactly the same pattern. And each one has a dart where the shoulder will be. So you're gonna wanna sew those shoulders, darts. You're gonna wanna press them I'm going to do that on the front, on the outside fabric and on the lining. And then with a wrong sides together, you're going to baste them together. You can pin them too, but you know, basting is just so much easier because you don't have to deal with all these pins when you're doing the binding. So what we're doing now is we're running a bias trim around the sides. Let me get to a point where I've actually trimmed it. Uh, and we're seaming that onto the um, right side to right side. We're turning over the folded edge and we're going to sew it down with a little slip stitch to the back. So it's gonna make this nice sort of like bound, um, bound edge. And you know, um, this is these mitered corners sometimes can really be a little bit of a pain, but I was, experimenting and I don't know what uh, what you guys use but if you um, if you stitch up into the point about you know uh, the distance of your seam allowance um, from the cut edge and you stop and you double stitch you're going to want to do the same thing on the other side so once you've got this you've got this little sort of triangular fold here and that will once everything is trimmed it will fold really beautifully when you, when you actually sew it down. You're gonna to wanna to do a little bit of zhuzhing, but it'll give you this really nice fold. In the back, you're probably gonna to have to fold it in. You know, let me get this right. You're probably gonna to have to do a little bit of uh, folding in the back. The back is not as important as the front. You want that front to have that nice sharp point and miter. So I'm going to finish doing this. I've already done the collar, which is exactly the same as the, um, as the cape itself in terms of construction, it's a piece of the cape fabric and a piece of lining, in this case, this um, red flannel that I think will be really nice and cozy. We basted it together and then we ran our bias tape around um, the three edges. We're not, in both cases, we're not doing anything to the, to the um, neckline yet because what we're going to do is once this is all bound and sewn down, we're going to be, you know, and also when you're cutting, it's nice to have a little alignment like we had been talking about. Um, but once this is all done, we're going to base the collar in position around the neckline of the cape. And once we've done that, we're going to uh, run our, or rather attach our bias um, strip, fabric strip. And I'll show that to you in the next step, but our bias fabric strip is gonna come around the neckline. We're gonna sew it down with a quarter inch seam allowance. We're going to clip into that um, neckline. We're gonna trim it, and then we're gonna turn the bias over and under and sew it to the, uh, the lining side of the cape. So it's gonna basically make that nice little, hopefully rolled, um, rolled collar effect that we're going for um, with these types of clothes. So I will, um, I'll work on this. I'll come back and show you um, the, the bias strip attachment and how we treat the, the collar. So here's her cape put together. 
get rid of some of these stray threads. It's, um, again, it's very, very simple construction. We put a little, which I can't seem to close, we put a little uh, hook and an eye at the neck closure, but you could tie it with a ribbon if you wanted. Um, again, we've um, attached the collar using a band of um, fabric cut on the bias. And we have sewn it in such a way where our collar has been placed wrong side to right side. We're, again, we're trying to align something here. We've aligned these pattern, these stripes in the pattern. And then we've taken our bias trim and we've laid it um, around uh, and pinned and um, sewn it down, trimmed our seam, flipped the bias around with a turned under edge and we've slip stitched it to the lining. So again, very, very, um, very simple type of construction. I think actually it's kind of funny, like when I put this on her and I was looking at it, she had kind of has like a little, I don't know, <laughs> maybe like a Joan Crawford sort of uh, shoulder here. It's very, very, I might adjust these hooks a little bit so that one's a little farther in and you don't have any gapping, but um, she has very sort of square shoulders. She sort of reminds me of a, um, I don't know, someone from the 40s, but even though this is the 1890s, it has that sort of shape. So there she is. She is um, ready to go out and uh, do her round of Christmas parties. Um, again, if you want to trim this a little bit more with soutache or again with a ribbon closure, ribbon closure might actually be very pretty. I think I might try that um, just to give it a little bit more, uh, even if it's just like a bow that goes there, I think that could be very pretty. She could even have a bow at the top of her, her tam. I might even try that too, just to give it a little bit more um, whimsy. So um, our next uh, this this dress and um, and cape and tam will be sized both for the medium sized doll and for the larger doll. Um, the only difference in terms of the the trim when we're doing the larger doll is that we had actually cut this bias down a little bit to make it a little bit narrower. Um, I think basically what I did was it's a you have a, a fold on each side of the bias. I cut one of those folds on the fold edge and use that as the raw edge, just because I want it to be a little bit narrower. But I think I probably will use the full, uh, the full uncut bias, um, cotton bias binding on the larger size. Um, the, the next thing we're going to do is make that little nightgown for the smallest doll, which is very, very simple construction. And I will be back to show you uh, the steps involved in that piece. So the nightgown for the smallest doll is cut out of one piece of fabric and it's cut kimono style, which means that it's on a double fold or actually this is the way some chemises were cut too. Um, it's going to be on a double fold and we're going to, or we have um, narrow hemmed the sleeve ends and we've done a rolled hem around the neckline and just because I like to do this, I've turned the hem up um, on the two um, bottom sides, just because I think when you put this right sides together, you know, you've already sort of got your hem pressed out. Look, it's not like the most even thing, but at least, you know, you've got a line that you can work with when you're doing your hem and you don't have to do that after it's been sewn together. This is a, you could see this is a really wide, garment, but what we're going to do, or wide neckline, we're going to um, whip a piece of lace that has a little bit of an open um, edge to it, and we're going to weave our silk ribbon through that and draw it up as a little drawstring. We're going to whip lace onto either of the, um, the sleeve edges, and we're just going to run that tight with thread when we dress the doll. Um, so it's going to be very simple. 
you know, I don't think that this, that little doll is probably in my, in my mind, she's just always going to wear that little nightgown. I mean, you can, um, you can do this so you could make it removable, but I just didn't really want to make it complex with any sort of opening in the front. Um, this should just be a very simple little garment. And I'm actually using a very thin, um, <clears throat> sort of muslin here. I think you probably use a little heavier, um, batiste for this, but I just had this on hand and I thought I would use it, but I don't think it would probably be this sheer, um, in reality. So I'm going to apply the lace and apply the um, the ribbon and show you this piece when it's finished, but it's very, 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 again, very simple one-piece construction. So we whipped lace onto the edge of our neckline and we whipped onto the uh, edges of our sleeves. And then we, with right sides together, we've seamed it uh, across the, the sleeve seam and down. Um, we've uh, trimmed that, we've overcast it and pressed it, and then we turned up our hem and we um, hemmed that in place. So what we're gonna do now, as you can see, again, huge garment, we're going to run our silk ribbon throughout this lace heading. We're gonna pull that up to fit the neckline, and with the dress on the doll, we're going to gather around the sleeves and we're going to gather these to fit so it'll be a kind of like a um, a full sleeve nightgown um, i'm going to do that and we'll come back and we'll show you uh, how that looks so here she is uh, the thread um, uh, the ribbon has been threaded through the uh, lace at the neckline and drawn up and tied into a bow um, the uh, ends of the sleeves while the doll is dressed, we've run a gathering stitch about a quarter of an inch up from the hem and we've tied that off on both, tied that up and tied it off on both sides. And now we're looking at making a very simple little nightcap for her. And in your pattern, you're going to see that you have a, a pattern for this. You're gonna cut two of these circles out of the, your fabric, your nightgown fabric. You're going to seam them together, but you're gonna leave a little bit of an opening for turning. You're going to turn that, turn it inside out, slip stitch that opening shut, uh, rather closed. And then you're gonna run a little bit of lace trim around the edge, the outside edge. You don't have to whip it. It can just be something that you just put on with a running stitch. And the next step on this is be, would be to gather this up to fit her head. And we're gonna be using a slightly stronger thread and probably running the gathering stitch about a quarter of an inch away from that, um, the, the edge of the circle. And then we're going to draw it up, fit it to her head, tie that off, and then tie in the little bow probably in the front just to give her a little bit of color. So that is the, the that's the last um, ensemble for these dolls. Um, I think if you really want to have some fun, you could also just like create a nightgown for your larger size dolls too. I think this is just such an easy pattern to scale up and down. Um, very, very simple. All you have to really do is just sort of take some measurements and, and cut it out of some paper towel or, or some tracing paper. So I hope you have fun with this. Um, these three little dolls were a lot of fun to work on and I hope that you all have a wonderful holiday. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification button.